Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Um, let's pretend that we are motivated again to hear something about taxation. And um, yeah, this time this is a small lecture on international inheritance tax, as the lecture is called. But in reality, we will more deal with the treatment of national and international cases under inheritance tax law. And for those who were lucky never to have seen me before, I introduce myself again. My name is Norbert Datzenberg. I am a professor for business administration and taxation at the University of Applied Science at Kleve. Kleve is somewhere in the Lower Rhine area, Nieder Rhine in Germany. And uh, we have a study program for international taxation and law. And uh, yeah, well, uh, chapter one is today's topic um, that will deal with basic questions of inheritance tax. So the first question is what necessary background do we have to do to deal later more closely with such a tax? Here we have an overview about what is going to come. The first question, which is probably interesting, is if the tax is justified at all. So, um, yeah, why is that a question? Well, the answer is there was a heap of people who always asked this question because uh, there are some arguments against inheritance tax brought forward by people who do not like it. Huh? So, well, who likes a tax? Probably nobody apart from the people working in the fiscal office and they don't count. Well, they are biased. Huh? So the arguments against the tax is we have already paid a tax when we earned the money as our income. And this is a tax which is just unfair on the rich. This is uh, motivated just by envying people who had success and so on. And now you could probably have a closer look on this ideas. For example, we have already ha paid a tax when we earned the money. Now, if this is about inheritance tax, that was not you who paid that tax. That was somebody else, the people who got where you got the money from, or the people who, from whom they got the money. From, and it might be a long time ago when this property was accumulated by achieving income. So that might go back to the Norman conquest of England, you know, 1066, when William the Conqueror came from Normandy and um, <clears throat> confiscated all England and then later gave this to oh, a group of French-speaking Normans who did not feel well in Normandy, which everybody can understand, who has prejudices against the weather there. And their solution was they made over to England where the weather is also bad. So might be that you got your whole property at that time and then handed it down from generation to generation. So the idea we have already paid a tax as an argument against inheritance tax is probably a bit outdated, perhaps. Yeah? Then not you paid these taxes, but your parents, you paid nothing for your inheritance ever. Yeah? The tax is unfair on the rich. Well, that's not an argument, that's just a phrase. Yeah? And uh, if we deal a bit closer with that phrase, the question is, well, whom do you expect the tax to pay taxes? The have nots, so, um, huh? the people who have nothing or the people who have something? Well, um, one of the basic recommendations, if you want to be a successful fiscal minister, is don't plunder the pockets of naked people. Um, take it from the ones who have something. Right? So um, that is not an argument against the tax in itself. Now, let's look if there are perhaps arguments for the necessity of such a wealth tax or, or taxes on wealth. 
um, usually if something is necessary or unnecessary that can be found out if you look to extreme constellations so imagine a really extreme constellation you all know scrooge mcduck i at least hope so because it's um, as important for european literature as goethe or schiller or shakespeare uh, now imagine Scrooge McDuck has just died and all his fantastic yards of dollars have passed over by inheritance to his nephew and sole heir, Donald Duck. Yeah? Now everybody knows the business abilities of Donald Duck, never successful. So here we have now a case that somebody, the richest citizen of Duckburg, Mr. Donald Duck, um sits on a vast amount of money and never has any success so never has any income so donald is the richest guy in town but doesn't pay any income tax because he only produces losses and he can afford to do so has fantastic lots of money so um that takes some time to get rid of that by losses so um, Donald pays no income tax. Now, naturally, some people are working in his uh, money bin. So, for example, a cleaning woman or might be a cleaning man. That is not the decisive point. But that person works for an annual salary of, let's say, merely $12,000. As this is now an income, she or he has to pay taxes, income taxes. Um, and as all the criminals of uh, Duckburg are still keen on robbing all his money. Naturally, the money bin of Mr. Donald Duck has to be defended by the police. Um, you will have police officers walking around and having an eye to <clears throat> protect the money bin. And naturally, these police officers are paid. They get a salary from the state. They have an income. They will have to pay income tax. So everybody in Duckburg pays income tax. The poor pay taxes, apart from one exception. The one and only guy who is the most rich in town does pay nothing because he has no income. Um, now, would you in that situation accept the argument, I pay no income because my uncle Scrooge McDuck has already paid enough income taxes during his lifetime? Or would you rather be um, sympathetic with the idea, well, Donald, that was your uncle and that was last year and the years before. But in the current situation, Donald, let's have a hard look on what is going on you did never pay and you could pay why should the cleaning woman and the police officer with six children pay income tax whereas you don't pay um, and the idea you only ask me for a tax because i am rich and you are not that's sheer envy you lose us um, wouldn't you counter that by the argument, well, Donald, <clears throat> that's quite right. You are rich now and you net, never did anything for that money because you got it as a gift from your uncle or by inheritance. So um, why should you not pay? Do you imagine or do you have the idea that the others like paying taxes? Huh? Um and does the idea that all the others pay and their standard of living goes down and you don't pay, does that idea make you feel better? Huh? Um, would it not be a good idea to think if you also pay a bit of your wealth, then the amount of money which they need to contribute to the public fiscal burdens is a bit lower. Uh, probably that also could give you a good feeling so that you do something for the common benefit. So that might be arguments and probably from that extreme example of Donald Duck sitting 
and having losses only in his um, yeah money bin that probably can give you a feeling why there might be a certain necessity for a tax on wealth at least in situations like this one and so leaving out wealth as an indicator for the ability to pay would probably even mean that then your tax system becomes unfair. Yeah? Um, now the question is, if we think that wealth should be taxed, you have two alternatives. You can either tax it annually, but, uh, so with a fixed percentage that gives um, People probably the feeling that if I save money um, at the end of the year, something will be gone of that. And that leads to the effect that you can only do this with very low tax rates, because otherwise people never build up a property again, because saving money doesn't really pay. If you have 100 euro and at the end of the year, you have to give away 20% of the wealth tax, then you end up with 80 if you don't spend it next year and you end up with 64 only and so over the time quickly the whole property is gone that makes no sense so an annual wealth tax can only be carried through with a very low tax rate historically the experience is it works with 0.5 percent or one percent but not with much more so taxing wealth only brings a small revenue if you tax it in a regular annual tax, but then it's uh, combined with a very vast amount of bureaucratic efforts because you have to make an inventory and an evaluation of all the property which somebody has at a given date, very often 31st of December. And that is very expensive. And so, Many states today have abolished um, regular annual wealth taxes just because of um, the very yeah, low net revenue which comes from it. Uh, the revenue compared to the cost is just ineffective. Um, so that is a reason why taxing wealth once at one occasion only, death, for example, or yeah, is preferable. There you can tax wealth with higher percentages. Um, so you once measure the property at a moment where very often the property has just to be inventorized uh, for other reasons too. For example, if you have several heirs, then and they inherit together, then there must be somebody making an overview of everything which is there just to justify um, that everything is shared and distributed uh, fairly. Um, and taxing wealth at the moment of death has also the least possible negative impact on your ownership rights. You only are forced to give a percentage of your property away at the moment when you well, when you lose it anyway hmm? um, because most people when they die can no longer enjoy their property so they you they leave you your property and your ownership rights until the last possible moment and then money is taken away from you wealth is taxed at the moment when it does not really hurt you anymore um, so that seems to be preferable. Now the new owner of the property might feel a bit sad about that <clears throat> and might say, but my ownership rights are affected and an inheritance tax is an infringement of my rights of property. And, um, well, that depends on how you define ownership rights. And, um, uh, if you think that's a social construction or it's given by God and a divine thing. Um, if you just say, my ownership right just follows from my position as an heir of somebody else. And that's not the social construction. That is something 
which is a fundamental law of nature that my ownership shall never be um, yeah, infringed, um, touched by anybody at any given time, then, um, then that's interesting because one could also say, well, that you become the owner of the property of your parents. That is just a social convention. And if uh, society agrees on something, society can also agree on under which circumstances and to which extent that right is passed over to you. Uh, other solutions might be imaginable. If you, on the other hand, regard in the right to inheritance as a God-given right, untouchable, something which is rooted in nature, then we might uh, end up with a logical problem. How do you then, um, what's then your position to the inherited rights of the monarch? and democracy. Huh? Um, there have been times in history when the monarchs were told that to give away a part of their influence to the people was violating their divine right of inheritance to the throne, that they had to hand over their <clears throat> right to govern unharmed to the next generation and such things. Um, and indeed, if you based yourself on that logic, it would be difficult to justify democracy. Uh, even, for example, in the 19th century or so, um, you have a vast amount of literature which argues exactly in that way. The monarch has the right to absolute power unrestricted by a constitution just because of the right of inheritance. Naturally, from today's point of view, that's sheer rubbish. And it is a bit difficult then to bring forward that inheritance rights on property can also not be restricted by consent of society. It's difficult to say the one thing and then to reject the other one. So um, let's sum up. An inheritance tax is probably justified and um, perhaps even necessary thing in the tax system to make that tax system complete and fully fair. All the details will probably have to be decided. Naturally, which tax rate is a fair one, which not. That's a kind of um, political decision that can vary from state to state. But it's highly expectable you will find a kind of wealth taxation in the state if the tax system wants to avoid extreme situations of unfairness. Now, um, let's look to possible forms such a tax can take. There are two basic forms, a tax on the estate, that is the, the mass of property which a dying person leaves behind. So, um, the estate is all my property after the moment when I'm dead. Um, it goes to my heirs and then they will distribute the estate among themselves. Uh, for example, if I have four heirs and my estate has a value of 400,000, then each of my heirs will probably take 100,000 from my estate when the estate is distributed. So. 400,000 would be my estate. Um, if you, on the other hand, focus on the inheritance as such, um, then you look to what every heir gets. In my example, which I brought forward, four heirs, 400,000 estate. So the inheritance of each heir would probably be 100,000. And now you have two possibilities how you can design the text. You can say, the estate is taxed, so the tax notice goes to the person who administers uh, or takes care of these 400,000 which are left behind before they are distributed to the heirs. 
So officially, I am the taxpayer. That gives a rather humoristic view or idea. Now, the tax notice is addressed to Dear Mr. Dotsenberg, we know you are dead and gone, but as you are dead, we want to still give you a nice information. Uh, on the last second before your death, you still triggered a tax, the inheritance tax of X percent on 400,000. That's an estate tax. The other variant would be an inheritance tax where each of my heirs is taxed individual for the share which he or she got. So everybody of my four heirs gets a tax notice um, fixing an inheritance tax on the share of 100,000 which each one got according to the personal conditions which are relevant for the tax assessment of each of my heirs. Uh, both is possible and both can be found in real life. Uh, differences will be if the tax rate, for example, depends on the total amount is progressive. Then probably the tax rate for an estate of 400,000 could be higher than for the tax rates on four different small inheritances of 100,000. Hmm. Then um, It might also um, have consequences for different free allowances. Might be that, or for personal aspects, if you tax the estate or if you tax the inheritance, you know, there might be difference concerning the, the granting of personal allowances and other things. Um, the formal distinction between inheritance tax and estate tax could also have a formal consequence in cases of double taxation. Uh, you know that if the credit method is applied, then the taxpayer can credit foreign taxes on his um, home state tax duties, but um, it must be tax which is paid by him abroad, by him or by her. Now, under a very formal point of view, you could then say, no, the estate tax is not tax, uh, not paid by the heir or heiress. It is taken from the estate of the dead person, and so the taxpayer there is still the dead person. So it is not your tax, and you don't get it credited to inheritance tax. Fortunately, nearly no state I know of really takes such a purely formalistic view. Usually, if you are taxed abroad with a tax on an estate, that is naturally qualified as a parallel to your home state's inheritance tax. So that usually brings no problem. Uh, if you want to know examples for estate taxes and uh, inheritance taxes, an estate tax is in the United, to be found in the United Kingdom. And uh, a classical example for an inheritance tax model is Germany. We will in the later course of the lecture deal a bit more with the German model just because I am from Germany and Germany has that tendency to work out every tax law in the most complicated way and in a very systematic way so we can probably learn it practice a bit good in a good way with the german text. okay yeah i see um, that the audience has really been interested and um chapter 1.3 is going to follow after a short break that is probably just a quarter of a minute or so, but you can just enjoy a bit and make a small pause. And then we are going to go on with the next chapter. 
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed this small break uh, and perhaps you enlarged it by the um, yeah, by the stop button a bit. And now we are back here and have to talk about which principles must that text follow in order to function properly. So the first thing which you will notice whenever you have a look on inheritance taxes or estate taxes, I use the term inheritance tax now for both of them. Whatever you see there is that the gifts are usually included into the tax base too and that seems to be compelling um why that's the first thing you must understand why must an inheritance tax also include donations or gifts or however you call it well imagine it were otherwise so inheritance tax would only include would only tax property which goes over by inheritance hmm? Now, what would you do if you feel that death is coming? Huh? You would probably say, ah, son, ah, son, ah, I must ask you for a notary. Let's go for a notary because before I die, I will make a big donation to you. Hmm? Why? No, because then at the moment of my death i'm poor i have already given anything i have away before i died and uh, so my inheritance is zero or nearly zero so that's far too simple so if you come from the doctor the doctor says well you have two months left then you just drop in at the notary office and give away everything you have to your potential heirs. But then it's not a case of inheritance. It would be a case of a gift. And if a gift is not covered by inheritance tax, then you will just uh, change the tax into a tax on the inheritance of those people who are stupid or the inheritance of those people who die suddenly. So. And that would not be a proper and fair concept. So what you have to do is include all the gifts, which might be an avoidance of inheritance into the tax base. Um, now, now the extent to which you do this can differ. Um, according to my knowledge, the English just say, um, all gifts which have been made during the seven years before the moment of death will be retroactively included in the tax base. Whereas the Germans, systematic and uh, over exact as always, just have the basic principle that every gift counts. So every gift which you make from the first moment of your life until your death is in principle covered by inheritance and gift tax. Um, the next question is, tax, do you tax the worldwide property transfer or only the property which is transferred inside your own territory? And here the answer can easily be found out. Again, let's ask ourselves what would happen if there were no unlimited tax liability? Well, um, unlimited tax liability, you remember that from the basics lecture, usually means you tax the worldwide events and not the things only happening in your own country. So the tax claim is not limited to the inland events, but it's unlimited to everything which um, occurs worldwide. So in case of an income tax, the worldwide income is taxed. And so in case of inheritance tax, unlimited tax liability would be the adequate term for taxing the worldwide transfer or acquisition of property by inheritance or gifts. And the limited tax liability, on the other hand, would be the opposite, so that only the events which refer to uh, things in the inland are taxed. Yeah. Um, you know that from income tax already, that limited tax liability only covers income from the inland, and in case of an inheritance tax, only tax would be the um, property 
transfer of which is located in the inland. No? Now, back to our question, why unlimited tax liability is necessary. Imagine you had no unlimited tax liability. So I live here in Germany. I feel that my death is coming. And what do I do next? I just order my family, or if I can, I still do it myself, to sell all my inland property and transfer it, in, transfer it into money. Now I take that money abroad. And if I only had a limited tax liability, then I could now die peacefully because I have no property left in the inland anymore. No? And after my death, my heirs, who have now inherited my foreign-based property, can um, bring the money back to the inland and enjoy the money untaxed ever since forever until they feel death is coming. And then they will again have a small shift of property for a small time into another country to avoid taxation again. So if you limit your tax claim to the inland property, that means you can directly renounce on taxing inheritances because then it can easily be avoided. So an inheritance tax without a limit, uh, a worldwide tax claim cannot work properly. No? Um, now there is nevertheless a limited tax liability, but only for the people who do not live in the inlet. And one might naturally also ask why this taxing of inland property, which is inherited, but where the people involved all live abroad, while this is, why this is also necessary to tax this. Uh, well, imagine you have an inland house, which is owned by some taxpayer living in the inland, and you have a house B, which is owned by a foreigner. Then if the two owners die in the course of time, afterwards, step number two, the next generation owns part of a house only of house A because a part of house A is lost for the tax or to the tax office. Whereas if there is no limited tax liability, house number B is still complete in the hands of the son or the daughter of the original owner. Next generation dies and now the um, house number A is again reduced by a tax claim. Whereas house B still in the hands of foreign owners remains untaxed and unharmed. And so after some generations, the result would be that from the property of your own people who live in the inland, only a small percentage is left over. Whereas all the property owned by foreigners um, is absolutely untaxed. So that would give foreigners a far stronger economic position in the inland than your own people. And that can't work. And you would even by this give an, a very strong incentive to your own people to leave the country in order to become limited tax liability taxpayers. And that also cannot be in your own interests if you write the laws. So we will have to expect that most countries have an unlimited tax claim if they have an inheritance tax and that they additionally also tax the inland property transfers of foreigners. Good. Now, who should be regarded as a resident of the inland? for the purposes of calling them or subjecting them to unlimited tax liability. Well, the standard solution is plain and simple. The people who live in the inland, so who have a residence, a home in the inland or their domicile or however you call it. Uh, additionally, you will also cover those people who do not have a fixed residence, a home in the inland, but only stay here usually. So the people who have an habitual abode in the inland. That is necessary because otherwise you could again avoid unlimited tax liability easily. Imagine again, you feel death is coming. You watch your nice home and then order your son or daughter to burn it down. 
because if you get rid of your home, your residence before you die, then you would be a homeless person. And so you don't have a residence in the inland. You just stay there. Hmm? Now you would move for your last days to a hotel or into a hospital, whatever you like more or whatever is more expensive. And then you can die in peace because you don't have any residence anymore in the inland. So unlimited tax liability would be avoided. You would die with the peaceful and happy thought in mind that you managed to, to cheat on the tax in a legal way. So um, that again would be too easy and too harmful for the functioning of the tax. So a limited, unlimited tax liability without covering also people who only habitually stay in the inland without having a habitation on their, of their own um, that will not work. And so you must insist in residence or habitual abode in the inland. Um, now there is a peculiar additional aspect. Um, inheritance tax usually affects only a very small determined point of time, the moment of your death. Now, usually you would like to look at the residence and habitual abode of the persons involved at that particular moment. Yes, that makes sense. But on the other hand, if you only look to that point of time and that situation at that moment, you could again influence your tax situation too easy. Um, imagine again, you have that curious feeling and even the certainty that death is coming. Then you and your family move your residence abroad and stay there waiting for your death. So you canceled your home in the inland, sold everything, transported all the furniture across the border, um, waited there peacefully for the moment when you died and then not you, but the rest of your family um, get back to the inland after they inherited everything you had during the time when you had your residence in another state. Also, that is far too easy. Um, so it might be wise if you want to establish an unlimited tax liability to extend the unlimited tax liability, not only to people who live in the inland at the moment where the tax arises, where the uh, decisive event happens, but also to all people who lived in the inland until recently. So who just left recently. Hmm? Otherwise, your tax will probably be too easily avoidable, and so it will not work. So you can expect in a well-designed national tax law, not only an unlimited tax liability for the people actually living there at the moment of the events, but also for the people who lived there recently and then left. No? Um, now, what an individual legislator will have to decide in their legislation will be what is recently enough and what is too long ago in time. For example, if somebody dies at 98 and then it comes out that person has spent the first 10 years in the inland, should there be still triggered an unlimited tax liability? And there we will probably all agree, no, that is too long ago. But on the other hand, what if the move thing to um, the other country happened just one year, two years, five years, 10 years ago? Um, that has to be decided on which conditions, which persons, and which period of time such an extended unlimited tax liability should be um, applied. Yeah, um, so. The other hand, or the other possibility, what one could think about is uh, an extreme solution. Could one also extend um, unlimited tax liability to nearly everybody? For example, for foreigners who never lived in the inland. So could you make an unlimited tax liability for the people, for everybody in the world? 
who has property or any connection in the Indian. And then the answer is probably these people would then never invest anything in Germany if um, owning some property in Germany would already trigger worldwide inheritance taxation. So that would be very unwise. You can do that only with people who are based in the inland or have been based for a long time in the inland and not with genuine foreigners. So to sum up, we can uh, draw the conclusion there should be an unlimited tax liability and a limited one and the unlimited tax liability should also cover people who recently left the inland and um, moved abroad. Good. Next subchapter. Um, you will often observe that the taxation of an inheritance or gifts does not only include the amounts of property which are transferred at the given moment, but also includes um, former transactions between the same people also. So they tax not only the individual single transfer of property, but the cumulative transfer of property, which has happened during a longer period of time. Why? Well, now, well, there must be a reasonable reason for that. Um, the first thing is, very often you will observe that a tax is designed as progressive. You remember, progressive tax rate, that means not only the tax goes up with higher amounts, that also happens with 25% tax rate, 25% of 100,000 is less than 25% of 200,000 or of 300,000, but in case of a progressive tax, also the tax rate, so the percentage goes up, the higher the taxable amount becomes. So 100,000 may be taxed with 25%, 200,000 is taxed with 30%, 300,000 is taxed with 40%, and so on. Um, and now if a tax is designed as a progressive tax, then it would again be simple to lower the tax just by splitting up one transfer into several separated transfers. So if, for example, somebody has a million and the tax rate for 1 million is 30%, then a tax of 300,000 would be due. Now, if that person decides to split up that into two donations on different points of time, then a donation to the recipient at 8.13 in the morning of 500,000 would cause a tax of 20%, if 20% is the progressive rate for 500,000, so it would be 100,000. And the next donation is, in my extreme example, done on the same day in the afternoon at 5 o'clock at a different notary's office to make clear it is two different actions. And uh, then again, 500,000 pass over again, the progressive rate for 500,000 is only 20%, not 30%, so you pay again 100,000 in comparison to doing the same thing in a single activity that would have saved you 100,000 of taxes. And that can't work. It would be too easy. And uh, so you must set up the principle that several transactions done it separate points of time will be added up and viewed and taxed together because otherwise a progressive tax can too easily be avoided. So the only thing a legislator has to decide which period of time counts for adding things up and how the exact mechanism should be. But you must make, must establish mechanisms which avoid that the progression can be broken by splitting up one single transaction into several transactions between the same persons at different points of time. Now, the same logic comes into play if the law grants you free allowances, for example, free personal allowances between um, parents and children. Now, imagine that an amount of 100,000 can be transferred free of tax between parent and child. 
Now you have, um, as a parent, 500,000, which you want to pass over. So 400,000 would become taxable if you do it. Uh, now, if you did not have to add up all the transactions in a given period of time, it would be relatively easy. You split up the um, donation or make the handing over of that 500,000 into five equal transactions of 100,000 each. And now if for every transaction you get a free allowance of 100,000, then it would be clear every single transaction would not exceed the free allowance. Everything would be tax-free. And uh, so you saved, let's say, 100,000, no, or 200,000, or whatever as inheritance tax completely, just by splitting up one single transaction into several um, transactions of the same kind, but this, at different points of time. That can't work, and also that makes it necessary that you add up different transactions at different times and tax them not individually but tax the cumulative amount which has been transferred during the whole period of time. Um, what do you have to add up? Everything which would be viewed as a single transaction. So um, if you tax the whole complete estate irrespective of to whom it is given then you have to tax everything which has ever belonged to that estate and has been given away as a donation before. If you tax inheritances in the hand of the recipient and um, so you would tax differently what I hand over to person A and what I hand over to person B by inheritance, then you just have to add up everything what happens between me and person A during that period of time, during the last years. And my relationship to person B would be a completely different tax case, and only the transactions between me and B would count um, for calculating the cumulative amount. Seems to be simple. Good. Um, now the legislator is relatively free in deciding um, which period of time should be taken into consideration. For example, if you go back for a whole lifetime, that's rather a bit long. If you only, let's say, look down on the last six months, that's a bit short because when you begin to feel old, naturally you make your preparations. Um, so England decided on the last seven years before death, there is no compelling reason for seven instead of six or eight. So that's just an arbitrary decision of the national legislature. In Germany, they decided for um, taking into account the last 10 years. Um, that's, by the way, uh, an explanation why rich people in Germany tend to make gifts, huge gifts to their children every 10 years on one day, just to make the maximum usage of the available free allowances in the relationship between parents and child. Good. Now, additional question. This is something on international taxation. So former or later, um, we end up talking about double taxation. Now, the first idea on that. First concept, conceptual ideas on double taxation. So which methods are preferable under inheritance tax for elimination of double taxation. You know from your former lectures already there are two basic methods. The exemption method without or with proviso safeguarding progression and on the other hand the credit method. Now the exemption method that simply meant the foreign part of the tax base is left out under a double taxation treaty. It's declared tax-free in your home state uh, due to the fact that it's already taxed abroad. Yeah? Now, um, if you have a progressive tax base, then you might um, avoid unwanted effects for the progression by that 
um, proviso safeguarding progression. That was a kind of auxiliary calculation which said if the tax exemption were not there, how high would the worldwide tax base be? What would be the adequate tax if everything were taxable? What would be the percentage which comes out? And that would be then regarded as the yeah, adequate tax rate for that taxpayer and would be applied for the amount which remains taxable in England. But rather complicated and not our point here. Now imagine we would choose the exemption method in a double taxation treaty for the avoidance of double taxation in case of an inheritance tax. Um, yeah, let's again imagine what would happen. Imagine you are subject to an inheritance tax, which addresses your worldwide property transfer. But now you know that under the double taxation treaty with the sovereign country of far away Istanbul, all the property which is located at the point of death um, in far away Istanbul will be exempt from your home state tax under the exemption method. So, it will only be taxed under the inheritance tax laws of far away Istan. And now imagine the tax there is lower than at home. What will happen? Now again, you have a good uh, feeling for your own fate. So you wake up in the morning and have that nice feeling, okay, death is coming. Uh, now you compare home state tax rate is 50%, foreign tax rate is 10%. And now it's clear where you now want to have your property. Well, you want to have everything in far away stock. So what you do is with your last energy which you have, you wake up, leave your bed and organize the sale of all your property in the inland, turn it into money and Transfer that money as quick as you can to far away Istan and order somebody or do it yourself to buy property in the country of far away Istan for all your money, which you could make, um, which you could transfer at the moment. Yeah. Um, if only a part or a certain kind of property is privileged under the exemption method, you order your representative or agent or whoever acts for you just to buy only this kind of property and to pay every price which is not completely unreasonable huh? so that when at the end of the day you, buy, you die, you only have left property in the country of far away Stan, which is now under the double taxation treaty under the exemption method exempt from your home state tax. So the 50% tax rate of your home state will not be applied to that property. And instead of this, the 10% rate of far away Stan will apply. So you say 40% of uh, inheritance tax. So that's 40% more of your property left over of all you have. Uh, and so that pays off that maneuver. Um, after you died, your heirs will probably later sell the property in far away Stan again, turn it into money, take the money and return home. So um, it can still be reinvested in the home state economy, but there has not been that no, decrease of property due to the inherited sex. You could easily avoid it. And now imagine if you have double taxation treaties which grant the exemption method, people will use that maneuver and it would be sufficient if you only have one state in the world which has a lower tax rate and to which you granted the exemption method, then that is, yeah, the same as a break in a water pipe everything runs out, all the property will be shifted to that country, will not be taxed at home. The whole system of inheritance tax, which you carefully established, breaks down. So we can uh, make a prognosis. 
An inheritance tax will probably not grant the exemption method as a method for relieving double taxation. Um, that can't work properly. Uh, at least from that moment onwards, when you have a free flow of capital guaranteed between the two states, as long as capital cannot be transferred between two states, probably it might be possible to uphold the distinction and to say, okay, property which you have in the country of um, Strangestan can be subjected only to the taxes there. But from the moment onwards, when this model, which you see here on the slide, uh, I turn my inland property into money and then invest the money abroad and then later bring it back. Whenever this can work, the exemption method is the ruin of your inheritance tax system. So that's highly implausible that you will find uh, agreements between two states which grant the exemption method in the area of double taxation treaties, in the area of the inheritance tax. So first conclusion, it will be the credit method which will be applied, nothing else. Um, now, any problems left? So, is it necessary at all to speak about the credit method or to make agreements on double taxation at all, if it's clear that everybody will end up with the credit method? Well, the first aspect which you have to regulate is the credit method usually only credits foreign tax on foreign property and not foreign taxes which are strangely levered on inland property in the country of residence of the taxpayer. So um, someone must draw a line where the line between inland property and foreign property runs. So you must decide somewhere under which circumstances an item is so strongly connected with the foreign country that it can no longer be seen as an inland item. The second uh, aspect which must be observed or which deserves attention by the tax legislator is the credit method is usually, well, giving you a right to reduce your inland tax burden by the tax you already paid abroad, but it, that is usually limited to the amount of tax which you would pay in the inland for the item in question. And so you would have to find out or to establish rules how you can find out which inland tax you pay for exactly that foreign item. And um, there can be different rules, uh, different views which you can hold on that. So the tax credit, let's have a look a bit about that. Now, the you remember the basic idea of the credit method is what you already paid abroad that you don't need to pay in the inlet anymore. You can reduce your inland tax burden by the amount which you already paid abroad, but only for that item. So it's limited to the amount which you have to pay in the inland. So you see this from the examples here on the slide. Imagine in all cases, the inland tax um, for your item is 6,000. If you already paid 5,000 abroad, under the credit method, the remaining tax burden in the inland would be 1,000. If in the foreign country, you only paid 3,000, then the remaining amount would be 3,000 here. If you paid abroad already 6,000, then 6,000 is due here. 6,000 have already been paid. Remaining tax burden to be paid here is effectively zero. And now uh, the decisive aspect, if you owe to the inland an amount of 6,000 and abroad you already paid 7,000, then you don't get a refund of 1,000. That would be too optimistic, but then the um, credit is limited to the amount which you, is due in the inland. So 6,000 is at maximum reduced by 6,000 to zero, not to minus 1,000. The same with 8,000. 
you owe 6,000, you have already paid 8,000. So the remaining tax burden is zero. Uh, you don't get a refund or a credit, which can be offset against other tax burdens of minus 2,000. No, the maximum tax credit is the amount which you owe for that specific item to the indent fiscal authorities. This is the so-called credit limit, which all credit methods in practice know. Now, in my first example, the 6,000 inland tax were relatively simple, but there can be complex situations where it becomes relatively difficult to find out which concrete amount you pay for which concrete part of your property. For example, somebody dies and has a property of 500,000. And this total property of 500,000 consists of 400,000 in the inland and 100,000 abroad. Now under the Inheritance Tax Act of the inland, a free allowance of 200,000 is deducted and so only 300,000 remaining amount are taxed in the inland with a rate of 20%. So you end up with a tax of 60,000. Now in the foreign country, the inheritance tax on 100,000 was 20%. That means 20,000. And now the question is, how much can you credit? The 20,000 is in principle paid abroad. The credit method applies. So you can credit and deduct it from the inland tax, but only to the extent uh, or to the amount which you have to pay on these 100,000 foreign property under the inland tax law, not more. And now there are different ways to find that out. For example, alternative one would be you look to the proportions or the ratio of the foreign items to all the items our taxpayer has. Uh, everything which is there in the world is the property of 500,000. The foreign amount is 100,000. That is one fifth or 20%. So the idea is if I pay my tax equally on everything, then one fifth of the inland tax is also what refers to the foreign tax. That would be in our case 12,000. So the maximum credit amount would be 12,000. Paid have been abroad 20,000. So the maximum 12,000, so you can only deduct that maximum of 12,000 from the tax. An alternative view would be, let's look on the total worldwide tax base after free allowances. So you would say the total amount which is finally taxable is 300,000 after all the deductions. The foreign amount is 100,000 that is of the total final taxable amount over one third. So also one third of the final tax refers to the foreign income. So that would be 20,000. So 20,000 would the maximum credit be. 20,000 have been paid. So in this alternative view, 20,000 could be fully deducted from the German or inland tax base. Now, as this makes a huge difference, naturally the tax legislator has to decide in which way, according to which logic, um, the credit amount has to be determined. And there might be, apart from my first two alternatives, a third or a fourth way to determine that, which could be imagined. One never knows. But decisive is, as this has drastic financial consequences, you will have to clearly determine in the law the way how the creditable amount so the amount of inland tax which refers to that specific item has to be computed. Um, another case constellation where you see that finding out how much of your total tax you paid for foreign items can be rather difficult. Imagine here the property in the inland is plus 500,000. The property abroad is plus 500,000. The property in the third country Country B is minus 500,000. There you have debts, liabilities. So your total income, uh, no, your total property worldwide is only 500,000. 
Um, the tax in your residence country is brutal, 300,000, so 60%. The tax paid in country A is 200,000. And now the question is how much here can you credit? One idea might be you just compare the positive parts of the property, 500,000 in inland, 500,000 in country A, and you say of the positive parts of the property, half is in country A and half is in the inland. So half of the total tax refers to country A, that would be 100,000, then that would be the credit limit. Of the 200,000 which you paid abroad, you could only deduct from the German or Indian tax burden 150,000. Another way to view it would be uh, compare again the foreign property with the total, the final total of everything, so with the 500,000. Then 100% of your taxable property would be equivalent with what you have abroad. So your credit limit would be 300,000. You paid abroad 200,000, so you could fully deduct it from the inland tax base. And there might be other possibilities to calculate that. So there needs to be a decision in the law of the individual states and that can be different from state to state, depending on which logic they prefer and what fits best to the system. Um, so to sum up, in combination with double taxation, you can probably expect there will be the credit method, at least in modern double taxation treaties. You will have to decide which property is foreign enough to be um, eligible for the credit method. And you will have to um, decide how you calculate the credit method. When it comes to deciding what is foreign and what is not, there will be relatively clear cases where you have a clear and stable connection to foreign property, uh, to a foreign country, like houses, factory buildings, and other things. There is usually no debate possible that there is a clear relation to a certain country. Uh, other things, usually mobile property is um, not so clear because you can transport it over the border from time to time and from one minute to the other. So there is no clear and stable connection to one single state. So one would have to decide what to which state that belongs. Um, in the last decades, there has been a clear answer to that in most states. They usually regard movable property of a deceased person as belonging to the country of residence and not belonging to that country in which it by sheer coincidence was at the moment of death. Uh, for example, a Dutch bank account of a German taxpayer would not be regarded as Dutch property, but as property which belongs to the country of residence, so to Germany. The reason is a bank account can so easily be dissolved and um, transformed into an inland bank account and the other way around, that this cannot be the bank where the bank is located, which has your bank account. This cannot be regarded as a sufficiently close, stable and clear connection to a certain country. This is just property without any clear and stable connection to one individual country. And so by default of a better solution, property of such a kind would be attributed by most states today to the country of residence. So it would count as inland property in the country of the disease. And so if you had to pay foreign taxes on that by chance, then it would not be creditable because it's not foreign property. Okay. So the basic rule in most, um, in the logic of most states would be property where you have a clear and stable connection to one state is regarded as property situated in that state, whereas mobile property like shares, um, securities, money, jewels, cars, 
another mobile property would just because a stable connection to one state is missing regarded as property belonging to the country of residence of the deceased taxpayer or the donor of the gift. No? Good. Now with double taxation we have additional problems because um, a double taxation treaty on inheritance tax will be more complicated under certain aspects than um, a double taxation treaty in income tax cases. In income tax we only have two states in the game that is the game, the country of residence of the taxpayer and the country of source where the income comes from. Now, when it comes to double taxation and inheritance tax cases, we have two persons at least involved, the person from whom the property comes and the person to whom the property goes. So we can have two countries of residence and we can in addition have the uh, source country of the property. Um, now you would have to decide a sequence. If the credit method is applied by all three states or so, then in the end the highest tax rate will prevail for the overall burden, but it will make a difference which state collects the money first and which has then to credit. That just makes a difference for who gets which part of the total cake. So um, you would have to fix a sequence of crediting. And um, there is an OECD model convention from the 1980s on inheritance tax, which has um, suggested and made popular the following sequence of events. First, if there is a clear source state, and look back to the graphics here, clear source state is something where for the OECD and for most states, property has a clear and stable relation to a certain state and to nothing else. Now, where such a source state exists, sorry, there the source state levies a tax first. Then afterwards, the second step is, or the second bite is done by the state of residence of the deceased person or the donor. And only at the last stage of events, the state of the recipient, so the person who gets the money, the heir, the donee, applies its own tax law and credits them the source state tax and these taxes levied by the country of the deceased. The reason for the yeah, privileged position of the country of the deceased is plain and simple to be explained. The OECD and uh, most states involved just see or justify their sequence by, yeah, by looking to the facts that, um, well, when the deceased person dies, the property is no longer fixed or connected with the person in that state. So. This is the last possible point of time where the state of residence of the disease can ever levy a tax. And so they say out of a certain feeling of pity, well, okay, we grant them prevalence here because for them it's the very, very last time. Because whereas now the state of residence of the new owner then begins to tax the worldwide property and will be able for a long, long time now to tax the worldwide income from all that property. And so they will be in the better position in the future. And so at the moment they can um, show some generosity because their tax position in the future will be hugely increased or will become better, whereas the state of residence now has to part with all the taxation chances. That is why the sequence is source state first, resident state of the deceased or donor second, and state of residence of the heir or donee in the last step. Good. Now 
next we will also have to talk about the economic consequences of an inheritance tax and this is probably um, a good subject for another video so for a video on chapter one a second part i thank you for listening until now i hope you enjoyed either that you could listen to this video or either that is now over or both one never knows and uh, please don't forget to recommend this channel to others whom you like or whom you don't like and share the video with people whom you think they might be interested or with people whom you think um, they deserve it to suffer that just depends on your personal motivation um, it was great to have you here and i hope to see you back soon for chapter one four and the rest of chapter one of international inheritance tax thank you for watching and um, enjoy the rest of your day thanks